You are listening to Road to CEO, nothing but in-depth interviews with executives about their journeys as CEO. I'm your host, Will Marlowe, and I hope you enjoy the show. Change this or create this or make this. Um, but then, you know, you get into that entrepreneurial territory where you're actually doing something about it. I'm here today with Justin Murphy, the CEO and founder of Your Creative People, a leading branding and creative agency in Greenville, South Carolina. Justin started YCP in 1999, and today we're going to hear about his journey leading YCP over the last 20 years. Justin, thank you so much for being on Road to CEO. Well, thanks for having me. So did I get that right? Is that that the right timeline? Uh, Yes. So I started the company when I was 18 years old and here 23 years later, you can do the math and how old I am. uh, You know, we're, we're still kicking and uh, excited about what's coming down the the pike for us and scaling the company and some neat things uh, here on the horizon. That's very cool. So it's pretty unusual to start a company at 18 and to be able to grow it and run it for years after that. How did that, how did that happen? Well, unusual is just another way to say crazy. (laughs) So sometimes when you have, you know, when you're young and you have these grand ideas and you're like, hey, you know, I could start this company and we could do this and this and this over here. And you have these crazy ideas and then um, you decide to do something about it, uh, which is, you know, so a lot of people have ideas. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, we could change this or we create this or make this. Um, But then, you know, you get into that entrepreneurial territory where you're actually doing something about it. And that's when it gets a little real, real fast. And, um, and then you start being responsible to clients and you're thinking, well, I'm, you know, I, am I really prepared for this? Do I really know what I'm doing? Am I really able to deliver? And all these questions go through your mind, especially when you're young. And, uh, you know, sometimes they still go through my mind to be fair. Uh, and uh, when you're in, in kind of that state, you know, you have people that come alongside you that are older, that have been there, and they give you encouragement, they give you advice, and they really come alongside and, and teach you lessons that they've learned through experience, kind of the school of hard knocks, so to speak. And uh, in, in learning from them, you can avoid a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I really look back on all these 23 years now and, uh, and think, you know, if it weren't for people in my life like that, I would not be where I am today. And, uh, you know, thinking even ahead, um, you know, how am I actually doing that uh, for people that are around me on my team and my leadership team? And then also, how am I mentoring others? Today, I was on LinkedIn. Um, probably most people go on LinkedIn uh, occasionally. And what popped up on the screen was um, a group or a friend of mine. She lives in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, she was talking about how she's mentoring people via Zoom, uh, really women entrepreneurs um, across the world. And, uh, you know, I, think, I thought about that. I thought, you know what, what am I doing to really give back to, to others what I've learned and really what people have invested into me? It kind of inspires you to do that when you see something like that. Yeah, I remember one of my early ideas. So you got me beaten because I, I, I thought I was a young founder when I started my company or my first company around 25 years old. And so you've got me beat by quite a bit, which, uh, you know, doesn't happen super often, but that's, that's impressive. <laughs> well, you know, It's not so much how many years you've been doing it. Uh, Yeah, sure, that helps you get experience and you have more to maybe draw from. But I think, you know, some entrepreneurs are are accidental entrepreneurs. Maybe they they decide that, you know, um, maybe they're working in a company, for example, and, you know, the the, um, uh, company goes through a layoff or something like that. I talked to a guy yesterday. And that was his case. And it, you know, it forces you under, uh, under the, you know, into the entrepreneurship uh, category. And then there's some of us who, you know, make the choice to go into it. And um, those are, those choices, you know, are a lot easier because you're not under pressure. But the truth is, re- regardless of what category you're in, you need people around you and you need people um, that can come alongside you and help you. Now, the key, key trait about it is you have to be willing to listen to them. It doesn't mean they're always right. It really doesn't. 
um, sometimes we have a board of, of six advisors and that's been invaluable to us over these almost 20 years um, to having a board. Um, so about almost 20 years of our 23 year um, tenure. And um, you know, the, the suggestions that, that they give are good. Uh, I remember one of our early board meetings had a guy who is at, um, he was an executive at Michelin and he came and said, hey, let's do an offsite. Uh, he was the chairman of our board and let's do an offsite day. So we went up to the mountains, which isn't that far from us. And we went and this, found this coffee shop. I remember him sitting down and he tried to give me, you know, all kinds of different ideas and advice from the corporate side. Well, you know, I was young. I didn't, I didn't really appreciate what he was giving at that point. I was open to it, but I couldn't see the connections. I didn't really understand how am I going to use things like risk management at the size of that we were like five or six people at that point. I'm going to do that. And so uh, as we were, you know, talking together, you know, I remember thinking, okay, I don't know that I'm ready for this advice. I don't know that I can really put this in action yet. It's too much. But, you know, now fast forwarding, you know, 10 years from that point, um, you know, I think, okay, I'm glad for some of those things that he told me then that I wasn't ready for. Um, but now that I can apply at the size that we are. So we have a risk management plan, to borrow that example, um, that, that really does address some of the key risks the company could face. And that's super valuable. Well, without that advice then, even though I wasn't ready for it, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be thinking about it today. So I appreciate the people in my life that have done that. Um, starting a company when you're 18, um, you know, it's a little bit um, daunting, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of go in and you're like, okay, I'm working with adults at this point. You know, I don't even feel like an adult. I uh, haven't even gone to college yet. Uh, I was a senior in high school at that point. Started the business with two other partners at that point who were mm -hmm. much older than I am or was. And, uh, and one of our first clients was, was a pretty big deal, you know, kind of get past the, okay, my dad is in business. Um, he's not a uh, in the space that I'm in, he was in construction and, uh, and, and just watching him work was helpful. But when you're in it yourself, it's a different animal than just watching it. So what was the, what was the company like in 1999? You said you founded it with two other partners. So what kind of business was it? Was it always a creative agency? Yeah. So early on and, and really, uh, we found it in January 1st of 1999 officially, but it probably took a good three months or so before that of planning, meeting together at each other's homes. And at that point, the three partners, um, myself and two others, uh, had known each other from our church. And so we kind of knew each other that way, but um, not super well. And um, one of the partners had a um, like a hosting, a web hosting business. And so he hosted maybe 20, 30 clients. Um, and he was more in the programming server space. And so he was money that way. And um, the other partner worked at a company that did um, like uh, planners and he was a designer. So he, mostly print. And then my side, um, I had learned uh, Photoshop and, and some of those things um, probably since I was maybe 15 to 16 playing around and then, you know, get my first laptop. And back then they, you know, barely did anything and, uh, you know, working hard to afford that by mowing grass at the side business, mowing my neighbor's grass, mowing my dad's grass, mowing, you know, businesses down the street, their grass, just to try to make some money as a high school student and uh, working that way to afford kind of some of the hobbies, like buying a computer and things like that, that, you know, my dad's like, no, you have to pay for that. That's something that you need to work hard and learn those lessons for. So I did and, um, you know, learned a lot of great customer service uh, aspects from mowing grass, uh, learned, you know, you have to work pretty hard in the summers when it's really hot and, uh, and stick with the job until it's done and do it right. And some of those lessons carry over to today. Um, but early on, you're taking kind of some of those lessons, taking my, yeah, I wouldn't say background at that point, but just playing around with Photoshop, learning how to design. So I'd always had an art background. So I drew um, really since I was four and had entered and won different competitions, did photography, same thing. So I had kind of some art bent to me, had some lessons and classes and things. And so I had this art side and I learned Photoshop and got into the world of graphic graphic design and thought, you know, I could, I could actually do this. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, when, when the other two partners, they were like, Hey, well, we could do this aspect and I could do this aspect. And so I kind of focused on the sales side and the 
more web design because that was where you know things were just starting up and we used some pretty vintage software at that point <laughs> to uh, build websites that by today's standards uh, aren't even close it probably was cutting edge at the time though it was cutting edge it was it was like wow this is you know dial up was the thing and now in AOL and chat and all those things and and um, and now we don't even think about those things. We can do more on our watch than we could have back then on, on uh, you know, the desktop. So, um, you know, coming together like that and pulling our resources was um, just a kind of a good mix, it seemed like at the time. And what, what was challenging though, and, and I think every partnership runs into this, if you don't, you might have a great idea, you might have great people, but when you pull your, 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 your things together and you form this more permanent relationship, um, you know, it's very similar to marriage. You know, when you put two people in the house, you know, you might be friends and things like that beforehand. And, and of course, if you're married, you should be. Uh, but, but in a partnership, it's, it's a similar thing where you're really learning, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road. What are they like in a normal sense and every day working, you know, in this way? And um, if you don't have on the partnership side roles clearly defined, that's going to be a recipe for disaster. And so many partnerships end that way because they're not really clear on okay, what are your what are your strengths, what are your what's the role that you need to have based on those strengths, and you know what are my strengths, and how do we dovetail? How do we actually stay in our lanes but yet complement, help each other? And so, um, you know, our partnership really wasn't defined like that. And I wish now looking back, I had done that uh, because that partnership really didn't last but a year. Uh, and then, um, you know, with, with the growth that we have, which was pretty exponential at that point, it's starting out, but also even by today's standards was, was pretty fast. Um, you know, that was part of when you add, you know, the pressure of work, you add, you know, deadlines and you, you all are working under pressure, roles aren't defined. And you get into a state where, you know, you're making money and that's not clearly, clearly defined as well. You know, it, it just really breeds or sets up a perfect storm for it to end badly. In our case, you know, there wasn't a big, huge falling out that I can remember. But, you know, we really all understood at the end of that year, you know, this is probably not the best thing for us. And I think the other two partners went on their own together and then they ended up splitting up. So, um, you know, for me, you know, being um, the age that I was, um, getting ready to go to college, I felt comfortable just saying, okay, let's take this business, let's go and, um, you know, work on it from my dorm room on the side, pay for college and books and things like that. Um, and, uh, and that's what I did through college. And um, then at the end of that, felt pretty strongly about um, the idea of, okay, maybe this could go somewhere beyond what I thought. Um, my partnership experience kind of gave me a sour taste for business. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of ready to throw the whole thing away, uh, but I needed some way to pay for certain things through, through school, through college. And I thought, well, let me not throw this away. Let me just you know, do it for a while. And uh, really no intention at that point of being where I am today, full-time in business, leading a company, having a leadership team and a full team behind us, working internationally, all those things. I had no idea. Um, but in that whole journey, you know, you kind of hit different things and you realize, okay, maybe this could go and um, in different directions and different people intersect with you and clients. And you know, it really helps you um, evaluate, you know, what, what you should do and what the next step is and what you're good at. Yeah. Very interesting. So do you remember when, when did you hire your first W2 employees? So I remember I was scared to death to do that uh, because, you know, it's one thing working out of your dorm room and then, you know, transitioning from me to an apartment. And I had a two bedroom uh, apartment and one of those bedrooms I converted to a office, quote unquote. And that had basically a desk that I had for a long time and, uh, and a, um, a Dell desktop. And so, you know, that was my office per se. And uh, I remember, you know, working with contractors and, you know, at that point, working with contractors basically meant that I would do the design for a website and mainly the company was website focused at that point. Um, and then they would come in and do the programming. And I thought, okay, this is, this is not bad. Hire them for a job and, and, you know, move on to the next one and things like that. So, um, but in the programming space, what I didn't realize you have to support them, you know, and continue to support the websites that you 
you know, build, of course, and the software that powers them and hosting and things like that. And that wasn't my skill set, so I needed help. Uh, so, you know, in thinking through um, that first employee, I thought, I, I assumed it would be a, um, you know, a programmer and somebody that could come along that way and add value in that way. But my first employee was actually a bookkeeper. And um, that was because taxes were a very real thing once you started making a certain amount of money. And so that quickly pivoted to hiring a bookkeeper who could also be an admin assistant. And so that was actually our first W2 employee. And we were in a, I remember we didn't have an office. We would meet downtown in a coffee shop, I think once a week. And, uh, and that was our meeting space. And, um, and that's just how, you know, how it started. And then from there, hiring, you know, people to come on board, um, you know, from a, a part-time, so she was part-time first and then hiring my first full-time employee, of course, scared to death to do that. Then moving into our first office, which was about 350 square feet, which is not a lot of space. And by that point, between contractors and just part-time, and I think we had a couple full-time at that point, um, you know, we were cramming eight people in a room, one room. It's kind of like a one-room schoolhouse. Um, doesn't work for very long. What was interesting about that space is the upstairs of an old building, a house near downtown across the street from a, a park. And um, so the park had tennis courts. So at lunchtime, we would all, you know, go down to the park, play tennis, come back, do our work. And that was kind of our, our break in the middle of the day. And uh, it was a fun experience, kind of those good old days. But right next to us on the same floor, so across the hall in this old house, which had wooden stairs, the you know, every time you come up the stairs and, you know, maybe we weren't as quiet as we should have been. Okay, fine. But um, we were in this house and down below on the first floor was a, um, uh, I think a therapist, um, like a counselor type person. And then across the hall from us was a massage therapist. And she didn't really like us because she had this Zen thing going <laughs> and she wanted this whole experience for her clients. I don't know why she picked that building. But, you know, we were, we were kind of, you know, eight people louder coming up the stairs, disrupting her Zen. And so, you know, we, we quickly realized that our relationship with um, this massage therapist, whose name was Dove, she was like a, a peace child. Um, she was very kind of, she was strange um, just to talk to. She just had some really weird mannerisms and just, she, you just really wondered where her head was at. But apparently she was good at what she did. And, um, and so, you know, you had this creative agency and this Zen, you know, experience on the other side of the hall that she wanted, and that's just not going to work. And so we ended up moving um, from 350 square feet to about 1,100 square feet. And that was a pretty big undertaking, you know, because we're taking on some decent sized rent in a major office building. Um, and that was a pretty big step. And how many, how many years approximately in would that move have been from 300 to 1100? Uh, well, we were uh, one year in, in in that house, and uh, and we had some good memories, uh, you know, there, and that was kind of fun. I remember uh, we had a Christmas party, and we had a live Christmas tree. Instead of deciding to take it all the way down through the house after the party, we decided to throw it out the window. Um, I don't think our landlord liked that too much, but um, but we had some good memories um, uh, from that space. And then we moved and had this 1,100 square foot space, and it felt like the palace. Like wow. You know, we had multiple rooms, like three of them. And we thought we had arrived. And we thought also, wow, what kind of rent, you know, this is and how can we afford that? That was the biggest, you know, most scary part of it. And then from there, looking at, um, you know, okay, as we added people, feeling like, okay, now we're starting to feel same pressure of, of space again. So we moved actually down the hall, same floor to a bigger space. And this was like 2,500 square foot feet. And it's like, whoa, and now this feels like a palace. And we had glass conference rooms. We could write on the walls and it was super cool. And we had a video department by that point. And we just had some, some cool things going on. Um, and, uh, and then we grew and we stayed in that space for nine years, which felt like an eternity. Um, and uh, and it, it was fun. We got to customize it and make it our own and, and all. But we quickly realized that, you know, we, we were continuing to grow. And so we actually expanded in that space by adding another maybe 600 square feet next to us. And, um, you know, the, the problem with being an entrepreneur um, is, is that you think you can do everything. That doesn't mean you can do everything well. 
And so um, we became, instead of just an agency that does creative stuff, we became construction people. So we put down carpet, we sanded drywall, we put up lights. Wow. Um, and this was really before like you could really find as much as you can today on instructions and Google or on YouTube. And, uh, and so we were doing all this stuff and it was totally crazy. We should probably never have done that. Um, I remember one day we, we decided, okay, we're going to have this vision of this long conference room and half of the wall is going to be glass and these big floor to ceiling windows that you have in storefronts and a big floor to ceiling door like you, you know, have in a storefront. And so we had this great idea. And so we had mapped it out. We kind of had an idea and measured it and all that. Well, we found on Craigslist this, um, this business that was going out of business and they had a storefront of glass and they had already taken all the doors and the, the you know, you, basically the whole pane was attached to a frame. So we had this idea where we rented a U-Haul truck, went across <laughs> town and probably four or five of us guys were loading these glass panels and these doors and the, you know, big, huge frame uh, storefront pieces of glass in, in, with the frame, you know, it wasn't jagged or anything. Yeah. It was together uh, into this. And so we're like so proud of ourselves because we're going to build this and we're going to do this. And so we get it back to our office and we open up that back door and like almost all of them are on, in pieces of glass oh, no. shattered, <laughs> except for like a door and maybe something else. And so we, you know, our, our grand ideas of building things uh, kind of went south, but, yeah. uh, you know, we, we learned a lot and, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't do that today, but just some fun memories along the way. Yeah. And then from there, we moved into a, a larger space, which we're in today is about 5,000 square feet. We have more conference rooms than we have offices, I think, and enjoy it uh, being here. So. Well, you know, in a lot of ways now, conference rooms are more valuable, in my opinion, than uh, than off than than traditional offices are, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, it used to be people were very attached to their workspace, right. and at least I've found that people are less attached to it, or if they are attached to it, it's much more of a casual thing. Right. And 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 the reality of it is, is that the collaboration happens in these other bigger spaces. Is that is that what you see? Yeah. So our conference rooms are are a lot of fun. They um, they tend to be spaces where we spend a lot of time just brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's really the heart of what, you know, thinking differently, our tagline is all about where you come together and you have to, you know, you have to think differently, but you're also working as part of a team where, where you're all minded. Hey, how can we make this better? How can we think through this from all the different angles that are yeah. here? So what, another just comment is that uh, it's interesting that your first hire was a, essentially an administrative assistant. That was also my first hire, uh, similar reasons. And I remember I was advised by another CEO who told me that when he finally bit the bullet and bought and, and hired a personal assistant, he doubled the size of his company. He doubled the, the revenue of his company that year. And same thing happened for me. Yeah. I, I got so much bandwidth back from that administrative assistant that it really transformed how I was able to use my time. I think you're right. I think that's probably what happened, you know, to us as well. And just without ever, like no one gave us that advice. Hey, if you hire that, you'll double your sales. Um, but I think honestly, it, you know, that's probably what happened in our case. It, it, I think what it does, it just frees you to work on the things that uh, you're good at. And I think that's the point, you know, because um, as entrepreneurs, sometimes we get caught up in the things that we're not really the best at. Um, but we're like, well, you know, I'm, I guess I'm here. I'm the best person in the maybe I have the time or at least I'm motivated and uh, that's not always the best thing for you to do I read an article one time that said you know what six or eight things that um, the CEO should never do like social media accounting and you know you didn't have a whole list and I was like oh yeah I'm kind of doing that oh yeah I'm doing that oh not accounting okay all right got one of the <laughs> things that I'm not doing um, but you know it challenges you to 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 be able to you know, think in terms of, well, maybe I should be doing the things that I should be doing and hire the best people to actually do the things that I'm not the best at, or just maybe I don't have a desire to do, or, you know, maybe frankly, I just don't have the time to do. So early on, you had a board of advisors, you said, um, how early did you, did you create a board of advisors and, and who was, yeah. what type of person did you, did you get on it? So um, that's probably the, one of the, most pivotal things that we had done as a company. And I don't remember where that idea came from. 
Um, I remember going out of the country and meeting a couple people on a tour of Israel, actually. Um, spent a couple weeks with them and met um, several people that were in business and they left a good impression on me. And around that time, um, they introduced me to the, uh, he had been retired from this role, but head of finance for Dr. Pepper. So guy has, you know, raised millions of dollars, um, actually probably billions on Wall Street uh, for uh, Dr. Pepper and acquisitions that their company made. And so he retired and then ended up being a, a dean of a business school. And so um, here in our town. And so uh, one of the people on the tour introduced me to him. We did breakfast and kind of hit it off. And he became officially our first board member. And then the next board member, um, I think, was the head of, you know, our former head of uh, uh, operations for the Kohler company. And so he then join our board, he became um, really the one that was invaluable in uh, giving us a heads up about a space in the office building that he was in. And so we moved in next to him on the same floor. And so Charlie was you know, instrumental in helping us get our office space. Mike was in instrumental in helping us learn the financial side of the business and, and really learning, okay, what is it, what do you need to um, really think about in terms of, um, you know, the, the um, company's financial health and long-term viability and setting up the nuts and bolts of how you set up your financial accounting system. Um, what do even some of those terms mean? Because, you know, yeah, as a business owner, um, you, you know, you're kind of responsible for all these things, but you don't, you don't really know them. And so having those people to advise and give you help and kind of shape a little bit, make sure you don't go off the rails is really important. And so those two uh, were, were early board members. And then we had a, a guy VP of customer service for a major company in manufacturing. He came on board. He's the one to help me with risk management and some other things. Uh, and then we had a, a person who was VP of sales. And she came in and challenged me on the sales side uh, and really provided some tips about asking the right questions of people. And I so I really look back on her influence in my life in a, in a really thankful way, grateful way. And then we added, um, you know, some other folks who would be helpful on the HR side or the recruiting side. We have an agency owner, um, former agency owner on our board now. So he provides some insight after years of experience owning an agency. Um, and so really they're a sounding board. So they're a board of advisors, not directors. So they don't own the company. They don't have financial interest in that sense in the company. They provide um, some, some help and advice to channel us in the right direction. We voluntarily report to them. We have two board meetings a year where we get together and really walk through the company's financials, company's strategy, company's future, where we're going, and give them opportunity to weigh in and uh, advise us in that way. So we've, we've had a lot of finance people on that board, but also sales, HR, um, in operations. And what we try to do is pair our leaders here with those board members. So um, guy in operations, so he's going to, you know, be mentored by uh, one of our board members in that space. Finance, same thing. And, and it's been a really good relationship over the years. Well, that's very cool. Yeah, I've not, I've not heard about that. It sounds like a pretty innovative management practice. I hope you're enjoying Road to CEO. It would be great if you took a moment to subscribe, either on the YouTube page or wherever you happen to be listening to the podcast. And if you really like the show, it would be great if you leave us a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. This will help more people discover the show, which will help us make more episodes. Secondly, I want to give a shout out to Royku.com, which is our sponsor for the Road to CEO podcast. Royku.com provides a black belt style certification program for people who want to learn how to do Google Ads, SEO, and Google Analytics training. We use Royku.com to train our team at the Will Marlowe Agency, and so we love the program, and it has made onboarding new team members much easier and faster, and it also ensures that everyone on our team has an excellent baseline of knowledge for managing paid advertising campaigns. So. Head over to Royku.com and either check out the free training lessons there or sign up for the Black Belt program. Now, back to the show. So after you went your separate ways with your two partners, did you ever consider bringing other partners on? No, really at that point, I think I had a bad taste in my mouth and it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't that, that it, I was like, you know, I, 
it wasn't that I really felt like that experience helped. It was more with that experience that I had with the the partnership and the first taste of that, first taste of business in that sense formally. Um, I just felt like, okay, you know what? I'd rather be more in the um in the vision casting directional um sense you know, as an entrepreneur and i think that's where my passions align mm -hmm. and align with the strengths and skills that i might have and um and so it really felt like going on my own but yet having people around you so owning the business solely but yet having people around you to advise and help uh, was the best path forward for me yeah so how big has the company become in terms of headcount approximately? Yeah, so we range from about 14 to about like 16 people, so to speak, uh, depending on the year and, and what we have um, from a staffing standpoint. And then right now we have a lot of plans to scale even further than that this year and into next year. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting connection for, that you have to the Holocaust. And mm -hmm. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so early on, let me, uh, let me start that over. Our connection with the Holocaust, and you really probably wouldn't necessarily connect those dots. Your marketing a communications agency, Holocaust, you know, there's a lot of years that obviously separated, um, you know, uh, the, the starting of YCP and uh, the ending of the Holocaust. But when, you, when we early on were first starting, one of the accounts that we got uh, really from referral, as we knew, I knew somebody at our church, and they ended up um, saying, hey, you know, I work for the lawyer in New York, and, uh, and he's representing this Jewish lady who is um, really, in, her, in, in their family sense, lost all kinds of um, heirlooms, um, art, things like that, and, um, and of course, in their case, you know, lost family members, which is even more devastating. Um, but you know, that you can't bring family members back. We all know that. So, you know, that's a delicate, you know, topic as you uh, really talk with some of these Jewish survivors uh, because many of them were children at that point. Uh, and a lot of them, of course, you know, weathered those storms personally. Um, but what they could get back was some of their, was some of their family's uh, heirlooms and some of the things that the Nazis actually looted from homes um, quite prolifically um, during that that war, and so when this uh, Jewish lady approached this lawyer, or maybe vice versa, I can't remember who initiated. Um, you know, the goal was, well, well, these assets, where where are they? Because you know, a lot of times, as you know, Americans and 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 other um, uh, countries, militaries went in. You know, they they didn't find. Uh, a lot of the things that were looted, you know, whether it's a, a famous piece of art that was taken from, you know, a store uh, of a of a of a Jew, or or even others too, uh, or or uh, you know, a famous um, piece of jewelry or something like that from a, a wealthy family, um, you know, a lot of those things went missing, and so um, it became, you know, surmised that and and documented then that. Nazis stored a lot of that in Swiss, German, and Austrian banks. And what we know about the Swiss banks is they're known for the privacy of their account holders. And so that's kind of their brand. Well, this lawyer said, well, I bet, you know, based on some, some accounts, um, those assets might actually still be there years after the war. What if we go after the Swiss, German, Austrian banks to get them to return those assets to you and your family and other families who are affected by this? And so he went and filed a lawsuit and went after them. And that was a huge deal, never been done. And so um, what happened, what transpired is as they you know, got further and further into this case, they realized there are hundreds of thousands of people that have been affected this way and lost um, similar treasures uh, and, and heirlooms. And so more and more people you know, we're hearing about this case and, and the way they heard about it mostly was that this lawyer put advertisements, mostly in print uh, at that time in, in most of the major newspapers in the world at that point. He spent a lot of money doing it and they, those newspaper ads would direct them back to a website. And that website is what YCP designed and built 
in 20 different languages with content for how and instructions for how you could be part of this lawsuit. And so you know, we were the, the web portion part of this case and the place, the landing place that, that people would come. It was interesting, you know, we would look at the analytics in the evening because, you know, it's, it's around the world. So you'd see people from all kinds of different countries uh, around the world on your site. It was pretty cool. And, um, and eventually in this lawsuit, um, you know, finally came to fruition and, and um, completion and they won. And so, um, you know, those account holders in, in this sense uh, were, were unmasked and a lot of them, you know, found to be people that, um, you know, had deceased, you know, so Nazis had this idea that they would put the heirlooms in these accounts and after the war, they'd come back and retrieve them. But most of them either were, you know, were killed or captured uh, or went missing. Um, so you don't really know. Uh, and so these assets were just sitting there. And so seeing those assets come back to these Jewish families, and not just Jews, but others as well, um, was just the real exciting part where wow. all this work that he had done, the, the others have done, and that we had done to help support the effort really um, was, was rewarded in that, you know, this really helped to benefit people. Um, and, and, and it didn't obviously bring their loved ones back. Nothing could replace that. But it gave them a connection with their family and some of their loved ones that, that really they didn't have at that point. And uh, being able to get those heirlooms back really made a difference uh, for them. And you know, today you can go to the Holocaust Museum in DC and read about this case. Um, you could, there are movies made about it actually too. And that's exciting to see uh, uh, you know, those survivors being able to, to experience um, you know, the, the thing that they most hope for to have that connection with their, with their um, you know, past relatives and their families going back uh, quite, a, uh, quite a while. And even in the midst of a tragic circumstance to have some, some connection uh, because of those things. So it's exciting to have been a part of that. And that's really what catapulted YCP into the limelight and into a, a financial position and a, a just even, even an operational position where it's like, okay, if you're operating at that level, you have to do, you have to really get it right. And you have mm -hmm. to really do this in a professional way. And it really pushes you, challenges you in a good way, puts good pressure on you to do what you need to do in, in the most professional way. And so that's really what helped us grow up a lot. I see. And, um, even as, you know, in that case, you know, being my twenties, um, by that point, or I think it was, or no, no, actually it was a little before that. So late teens. And then um, those sites lasted for a couple of years. And, uh, and being at that point, you know, I'm glad that I had that experience because it really challenged me and put that good pressure on me to grow and even uh, mature quickly in business and be able to learn what it takes to, to really support a client like that. So that was really helpful for me. And, you know, we're just grateful to have been part of that and that be part of our history. Yeah, what a great thing to be a part of. I mean, I would imagine that'd be so rewarding to be able to try to help with that. Mm -hmm. It really was. It really was. We look back, you know, as as our company has grown even today, looking back and, and kind of crediting that as one of the early milestones in our founding uh, in mm -hmm. our growth and development as well. Um, it's just neat to be part of something that, you know, made a difference in history. So on a practical level, you know, a lot of people listening to this are not agency owners. They don't necessarily understand necessarily how the referrals work. Did that lead to inbound phone calls for you where people would be referencing the website that you, that you built for them? Did it lead to other types of class action type business? You know, like what, what exactly did it do for YCP ultimately? Yeah, so a lot of what it did at that point um, was spawn other ideas. So there are other um, groups that were affected by the war in different ways. And then of course, World War II had, you know, um, the other side of the, the, um, the world with J Japan and some of those things what happened over there. So um, it actually spawned some class action business. And um, in the midst of that, we had other clients. So that wasn't the only thing we worked on, but um, you know, that took up a lot of time. So it did become a focus for a little while. And, uh, and, and we had, really at that point, plenty of business to work on. We didn't really feel like we had to go out and, and source a lot of new business um, to, uh, to maintain you know, the expenses and growth that we had in mind. So. I see. So another thing that's interesting about YCP is 
you guys have made some spec movies, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, a few years ago, we acquired a company in the video production space. So they had done uh, work in in for major brands um, like Home Depot. They had done Verizon, uh, Carolina Panthers work, commercials and things like that. So commercial productions. And, um, and so a lot of different circumstances happened and, and another, um, you know, some conversations began with the owner who we had developed a friendship with and we had toured their space. Um, and they, they had some things happen with health and some other, um, things happen in their family. And he just felt like, you know, this is the right time for me to transition this business. We ended up buying that business and, um, incorporating it into our team. We had always, we'd had a video team for a while, uh, but very small, uh, minimal gear, mostly DSLR cameras, which in the world of film is kind of on the low end, it's totem pole. Um, you know, the cameras that we purchased and, and use today are um, Ursa uh, cameras, 4K, 8K, uh, Ari Alexa um, is another camera that we use and system, the, all the system of everything goes with it. And we're talking cameras here that are, you know, upwards of 100,000 uh, for the equipment and all, and film, you know, that they used to film uh, like the Avengers uh, series and things like that. So kind of jumping us to a, a pretty different um, space because of that. And then in um, the early days, you know, we had this client that we were working for. He had this idea to uh, produce a TV show on working dogs. And these are the dogs that, that you see at the airports that sniff for, for bombs or drugs and things like that. And they can... Um, they're really in the training of these dogs. It's pretty amazing. Like I would never have thought of, of a dog can do some of these things. Like for example, during COVID, they were training dogs to detect in an early way symptoms of COVID before they ever came out. And um, you know, dogs have been trained for years now to, to detect early signs of diabetic um, shock. And so you know, the dog will, if you have one that's you know in your home will detect that and actually give you early signs to, to save your life. And so we've interviewed people that that has literally happened to them. The dogs saved their life. And on the, you know, of course, airport side, dogs, you know, protecting us um, from terror um, issues and things like that. And then, you know, on the, on the flip side, you know, there's a whole sporting dogs um, competitive side, which is interesting. And there's also, we go across, you know, across the ocean overseas, you have different wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, how dogs were used to really save lives from roadside bombs and things like that. And so we've interviewed tons of people that have um, been part of the military and police side. Um, we have, you know, all kinds of stories of how dogs really could be trained to do some incredible things. And so that's in the category of working dogs or professional dogs. And so this show, uh, we did four episodes uh, of a TV show uh, to with the goal of selling it. So we did these different episodes. The first one was on the um, really the founding of the show and the founder and uh, and what his experience in law enforcement canines were and the different dogs that really have in the end saved his life. Um, and uh, and so episode one, you can watch at ProDogTV.com today. You can watch that for free. And uh, then we have some other episodes that we didn't release publicly, but we um, we use to pitch to major brands like Disney and Discovery. And our hope is that um, here that they will pick that up and maybe end up on Discovery Plus or Disney Plus. We should have a link in the show notes to uh, uh, to the episode that's available for free. Maybe somebody from Disney is watching. Absolutely. They should buy it. We uh, pitched to Disney and one of the, you know, even at the end of the day, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the, the when you create a show like this, um, there's all kinds of things you learn. Um, one thing, you know, along the way, you kind of have this thought, okay, does put all this effort, put all this time, filmed all these um, folks and, and, and did all this um, scouting and shooting of different settings and B-roll and all this stuff for the show. And, uh, and you're like, okay, does anybody want to watch this? And so you don't have this thought. And, uh, and then, you know, you, you start putting it out there for people and they're like, yeah, that was really good. I mean, you were really moved by that, that episode, especially episode one. Um, episode one is really about um, a dog 
um, or multiple dogs, but one in particular that saved a police officer's life and, 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 uh, and seeing um, really the, the story behind that, which is pretty cool. And so when we had a chance to, to um, finally do our first pitch uh, officially, uh, we pitched to Disney, to a, D, a VP of content acquisition at Disney. And his goal was to buy content for Disney Plus. And he was in a different region than the US. We had connected with him through a kind of a trade show type setting conference. And uh, so in the midst of that, you know, he watched our first episode and said, you know, this is the type of content, you guys created something amazing here. This is the type of content Disney would buy. Um, we're, we're interested. Let me run this up the chain and, and pass it along to uh, people, you know, my counterparts in the US because he was in a different country. Um, and see if they uh, might be interested in, in purchasing this because this is this is unique. This is something different. And really, since then, we the show has won um, I think seven different first place awards from LA to London um, to Best South Carolina Film uh, two years ago uh, or a year ago. And uh, we're, you know we're excited to see how actually that show is done with audiences that they really vote it. Um, or and judges as well voted to be the top slot and and walk away with um, some good PR for the show and hopefully you know see that help it to get a sale. Very cool. So um, you've come a long way with YCP. What kind of clients do you have these days? What what kind of clients do you work with? So from a client standpoint, uh, YCP works with clients not just regionally here but nationally and internationally. Um, some of the clients that we've been able to work on, you know, major brands like Gerber, Michelin, Penn State University, mm -hmm. and uh, work in, in different settings like LA, Chicago, West Palm Beach, the Bahamas, going to Mexico, uh, going to Singapore, um, uh, worked with groups that have operations in China, uh, operations in Germany, operations in the UK. So quite, quite a diverse um, international presence as well. Very cool. Um, so if you were giving advice to some aspiring entrepreneurs who want to uh, create a business like you've done, um, what would you say to them? Would you say just start at 18 and, and uh, don't look back? Um, I, you know, from, I get asked the question a lot, you know, what advice would you give people that, you know, want to, want to follow their ideas, their passions, as far as being potentially an entrepreneur, and, and I really, I think for me, and I know this sounds crazy, but I actually try to dissuade people from doing it. Hmm. Um, there used to be a stat and it's probably still similar to this, but, but when I taught in the MBA program, I taught entrepreneurship for about seven years. Um, and uh, to people that, you know, wanted to get their master's in, in business administration. And um, one of the things I would do in, in our entrepreneurship class is really at the beginning is kind of share that you know more than half and it, it may have even changed today to, to be greater than that businesses fail within the first year and if you can make it to five years you know it's a pretty good milestone 10 years is another milestone um and so um i try to dissuade people from from doing the entrepreneurship track because i know one of two things will happen if they're really nervous about doing it they won't and they won't lose a lot of money, lose a lot of time, struggle, um, put all their weight and in, in, in the risk into that basket, maybe risking their family, um, especially when you have kids, it just changes the dynamic. So I try to dissuade people. And, and if they really kind of on the fence, they won't do it. And that's a good thing. Um, it spares them a lot. Now, on the flip side, if someone tells you you can't do it as an entrepreneur, that's pretty motivating. <laughs> And so um, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, may, may hear advice like, well, maybe you shouldn't or, or you know, this is going to be hard or giving them the, hey, this is a roller coaster. It's not always up. You're going to have some valley, valleys amongst the, the peaks and, and they might be long valleys and hard ones. You really want to do this. You don't want to risk that. Um, and an entrepreneur will say, okay, that's good advice. I'm going to think about that. And listen to that and then you know create a plan to help them through that maybe uh, get some people around them to help them when they go through those valleys um, 
an entrepreneur will, will go that direction anyway because it's in them. It's something that they're passionate about and not just passion. Passion gets you so far, um, but you've got to have grit. You've got to, you've got to stick with something long enough. Uh, and a real entrepreneur has more than just a, a great idea, more than just passion. They have grit. They stick with it. They see it through. Uh, and, and, and that can be very rewarding. If you're willing to, to, to be on the roller coaster to the end of the ride, you'll get off and say, well, that was a great, great experience. I'm glad I did that. You know, I accomplished something or I added value in a certain way that, you know, is different than, than the market had at that point. You know, I really made a difference. Um, and a real entrepreneur that is minded that way really has it inside to, you know, to pursue that. Um, they, will, they will do it anyway. And so that's why I try to dissuade people because, you know, at the end of the day, um, we want people that are really in this field, uh, not just in marketing, but whatever you create, could be a new service, could be a new product, um, you know, really believing in what they do. And if you have any doubt about that, you shouldn't do it. Um, you know, get with someone in that, that could do it. Give, give them the idea, license the idea to them. Um, I don't mean to do it for free, but, um, but, but um, you know, maybe within your company, maybe you have those ideas, but the risk is too great or your family isn't at a point where you can do that or financially you're not ready for it. Um, you know, be an entrepreneur within the company in place that you are, you know, anybody can come up with ideas. Um, start there, help make the space and place you are today better. Um, and maybe one of those ideas will turn into something that you can really hang your hat on and say, I can make a livelihood with this and go beyond something that's just a good idea or a hobby but to really risk my family, my future, and everything for the, for the goal of adding value and seeing potentially the reward, you know, as a result. So that's I, think that's, I think that's great advice. That's, that's fantastic advice. One of the things I sometimes talk about is um, how it's really important to know yourself and to know the, what you value. And specifically, if you value stability, more than uh, excitement, then mm. it's not going to be for you. <laughs> you know, and a lot of people don't know that about themselves. You know, they don't, they, they think that they value excitement because maybe that's, you know, because they've been through some exciting times, but until you've been through some uncertain times, you really don't know how much you value stability. And yep. so yep. I, I don't know how you, I don't know how somebody goes about figuring that out without doing it to a certain extent, but, but that's, but I, I will sometimes advise people on that because I, if you value stability and you get, and you become an entrepreneur, that is a recipe yeah. for disaster. Yeah. I can remember my wife can too, um, early on when, when, uh, before we were married, right before, not, not too long after we met a couple months, um, we had we had a uh, new marketing director come into one of our clients and we got a lot of business for them and it was fairly steady. So felt pretty good, but new marketing director came in and he said, Hey, I'm going to cut everything we're doing in half. Well, that's a big deal. And he's like, I want you to cut your rates in half too. Well, that was an even bigger deal. Now we said, no, now that's hard, especially when mm -hmm. you're really depending on them. And that's the other thing you can't, as a business, you can't depend on one source of income. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster as well. But um, you know, we, we had to stand up and say, no, 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 that's actually not right. We're adding this value and this is what we charge. Stick up, stand up for ourselves. And that was hard because, you know, you run the risk of, wow, you know, this could not work out really well. And I remember one weekend, um, one night kind of just talking with my wife, Caitlin, who at that point wasn't my wife, um, and, and really just saying, you know, there looks like they're pulling the plug on this. And that means that, you know, we could be, we could be as a company, we have payroll, we could be living week to week. And I can remember early or, or soon after that, where that happened, where, you know, it's, we really were trying to collect money so we can pay people on Friday. And, um, and that was hard. And entrepreneurs go through that. We see different, um, you know, we, we weather those storms and sometimes you can't really see the end of them. Yeah, uh, and I'm grateful that you know we we were able to um, see in our case she she got provide for us, but um, you know it's really hard to go through that. And uh, I look back when someone says, "Hey, I have this great idea," 
or I would like to be an entrepreneur. I look back on those times and I'm like, okay, you know, are you really cut out to do that? Because I think every entrepreneur goes through those things. If there's no free pass, you don't get to ride the roller coaster and only go up. Um, you have to, roller coasters go down and then they go up and then they go down again. And emotionally that's hard. Uh, physically that can be hard. Um, and you can work really hard. Um, you could spend a lot of time doing it. Um, there's just a lot of costs. You have to really count the cost on the front end before you do that. Justin, thank you so much for being on Road to CEO today. This has been a great episode. Thank you for having me, Will. Really appreciate you and all the work that you guys do. Hope to have you back at some point in the future to check in with us. Sounds good.